Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have Sawyer Hurwitz. Sawyer was our uh, director for this TV show that's just coming out, Psychedelics Tonight. So Psychedelics Tonight, Kyle and I produced five episodes of TV with the help of a lot of amazing folks, and it airs today as I record this. So I'm recording this on the 26th. Uh, this episode should be tomorrow, the 27th, and yeah, the show uh, started airing at altered.tv, A-L-T-R-D.tv for free today, <laughs> aka yesterday for your listeners. Yeah, so it's going to be awesome. Sawyer, really creative, really an amazing individual, been doing really fantastic art for a super long time, it seems like. And Sawyer is also an animator, does uh, augmented reality, um, all sorts of other fun stuff. His Instagram's full with amazing videos and collages and yeah, love it. So I was really hooked on Sawyer's art and all of a sudden we get to work with Sawyer and uh, Sawyer did some really great animations for us as well. The TV show, I think, expresses um, who we are pretty well. So we're kind of try to make light when we can, um, serious when we need to and um, smart, quippy. And um, yeah, I think it just expresses who we are quite well. So just really grateful that Sawyer was able to make that vision happen. So this recording happened uh, in downtown Los Angeles when I was there scouting venues for a conference in um, in the summer. I think that was in June. And um, yeah, Sawyer was uh, you know really <laughs> willing to travel hours to come over and record with me. And I apologize we didn't get that long of a podcast in, but it was really great to connect with Sawyer again. And yeah, since then I think we've seen each other at music festivals. And I was trying to find Sawyer's art at Burning Man. I couldn't locate it but he worked on a number of installations so just a great artist um great human and i think you all are gonna like this podcast not too much about psychedelics but we do get into it a little bit and yeah the show you're going to enjoy the show <laughs> if you listen to the podcast you'll probably very much like the show and again altered.tv altrd.tv you can get it on plex roku apple app store uh, i think android tv samsung tv so it's everywhere you can get it you can get it on your computer too so all right i think that's it for right now i had plans to do like a 20 minute intro but i think this is going to work so i think that's it for the intro thank you all for tuning in please let your friends know about the show too and yeah without further ado sawyer herwitz All right. Welcome to Psychedelics. Today is Joe Moore, joined by Sawyer Hurwitz. Sawyer, <laughs> stoked to have you. And uh, sorry it's taken so long. I wanted to do this right away, right after we met, but we were busy. Yeah, no worries. I'm always super busy too. So, you know, makes sense. I'm glad that we're getting to do it though. Yeah. So we met in uh, Culver City. I don't know what we're allowed to talk about. <laughs> I don't think we're on embargo with anything, but... I didn't sign any NDAs. <laughs> yeah. Like the, it was the easiest contract I ever signed was to do the show. So I'm like, okay, sure. I guess we're doing it. So you acted as a uh, director and producer of this show, Uh director and actually editor. So I'm supervising editor, nice. a lot of the post work on that. I have a team I'm working with, but uh, I'm heading a lot of the creative direction on that by doing a lot of graphics and VFX to kind of give the show a little, you know, humorous edge. Hell yeah. So we did like a five episode series and we're, kind of profiling different drugs, classes of drugs, things like that. Kind of a, we'll see how it turns out. I'm excited. Um, I, I mean, had a it, fun it, time doing it. It's coming together. It's Hell coming yeah. together. And I think a lot of the information that we have in this series is pretty great too. Like I certainly learned a lot and I've been involved in the psychedelic space for a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really fascinating to know what is coming through the pipeline uh, in the future of psychedelics. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's both like hopeful and scary, you know? <laughs> I was at a... There's two situations recently. So Leonard Picard, I went down to Santa Fe to record with him and he was saying something and he repeated it at a conference a few weeks later in Arizona. In the next few years, we're going to see hundreds of thousands of novel molecules that we don't know what to expect. They could be the new fentanyls. They could be better than LSD. They could be all sorts of things and we don't know. And uh, it's a brave new world. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the hundreds of thousands, that's the thing that blew me away when I was discovering just how many novel, I don't even understand the chemistry of that. Like it, it blows my mind that there can be that many new things coming to surface. Just, just change the angle of a bond. 
I know, but like, I mean, there's that Not. many permutations of, of <laughs> things that are still psychedelic. Yeah. But, you know, at least from what I was hearing from the companies that we are working with, I mean, it sounds like there's some really exciting work being done. You know, I think that we're really refining the process now of what a drug can be. And I think that it's going to teach us so much more about just how the human mind works and about, you know, and also provide like neurophysiology, new, neurophysiology, but also provide like so many opportunities for healing and also so many opportunities for abuse. I mean, I think that, yeah. you know, if we're really going to get, if we're really going to have the psychedelic re renaissance that's being poised to happen, then I think that a part of that equation has to be, mm -hmm. you know, the, the legal and therapeutic end also stepping up so that, you know, these uh, substances can be used responsibly. Yeah. So we need to be like education forward. We need to be working towards safe supply because, you know, who's going to eat XYZ random drug? We can buy what you're used to and interested in from Walmart, for instance. Right. I mean, there's definitely still like the, the research aspect behind totally. all of this stuff. Uh, of course, you know, if you just look at the history of how designer drugs have entered the market, the first stage in that research is people just doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways that's great because it, you know, it, it pushes forward the, the, it pushes forward our understanding of these mm -hmm. compounds because ultimately how much can you learn from rats? Their brains are so different. They can't from us. talk very well. Yeah, they're not really good at communicating how high they are. You know, they'll they'll behave strangely, but they won't really tell you the nature of their visuals. <laughs> <laughs> at least not in my experience. You know, maybe we'll find that compound that allows a rat to communicate. Ooh. <laughs> but <sighs> that could accelerate science. I mean, yeah, that, I don't think that'll happen. I'm just definitely <laughs> joking. But you know, I I think that yeah, as far as like you know, we're still years out because again, there's all the the clinical trials that have to all of these things have to be processed through beyond just them being created. But, you know, I think the the current stage right now is definitely education because I think we mentioned this a little earlier when you and I were talking uh, individually, we're at this inflection point in the future of psychedelics where it, the, the use of them, the importance of them is becoming something that people can't continue to ignore. I mean, we're seeing efficacy dealing with challenges like, you know, mental health, uh, dealing with challenges relating to addiction and an unhealthy drug war that is just hard for policymakers to continue to ignore. But right yeah. now that public pressure isn't on and it's not going to be on until we have a greater awareness and understanding of psychedelics is something beyond just like, Ooh, man, like weird, trippy, whatever, you know, or, or I, I think a lot of people, when they think of psychedelics, they think of dirty hippies, wooks, you know, but you know, there's so much more potential in these substances that is being realized now. And we're having the data come out that th this is the answer to a lot of problems that we're seeing in our society. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be able to apply that knowledge until we have public support coming so before we go too deep down that rabbit hole let's talk about you sure who is sawyer um who's sawyer? <laughs> right. yeah it, good luck yeah right so <laughs> uh boy i am uh los angeles based born i am a uh artist and a uh, filmmaker uh mostly doing a lot of producing editing uh and directing in the documentary nonfiction world i do a lot of like social justice documentaries things relating to a lot of challenges relating to incarceration, homelessness, things like that, as well as, as my art, I do, I go by the art moniker, Psychotronic Solutions. Uh, a great Instagram, by the way. A lot of great <laughs> stories recently. Sure. Yeah. Uh, psychotronics is actually the study of brainwashing. So, you know, I think my work is both a solution of it and a solution to it is kind of the idea behind mm -hmm. that name. And the work I do is augmented reality, um, sculptural collage, and also projection installations, sometimes uh, VJ sets at festivals, things like that. Outstanding super high level on your incarceration documentary oh oh uh, uh, just as an overview yeah just like i because I, I remember being really impressed with that oh yeah i mean so uh that one right now in oregon they are experimenting with what they're calling trauma rehabilitative models of incarceration so mm. right now most of the penal systems in the u.s are about you know penalizing people they're about like oh you did wrong we're going to punish you and we're going to sequester you from society and then in x number of years we're going to probably release you back into society with less skills more trauma and you know none of the tools or resources to actually survive in a world outside of prison. That's why we have such a high recidivism rate, is because ultimately we're not treating the issue behind behind criminality. 
it's, we're just punishing people. And it's a very archaic model. I think that if we do evolve as a society, we're going to look back on the way that we treat the mentally ill and people with substance abuse disorders and people that commit crimes in the same way that we now look back at how we burned witches. I think that it's it, it, ideally if we evolve as a society instead of regress, which, you know, who, who knows, but you know, I think that this trauma rehabilitative approach to prison the numbers that we're seeing in terms of programs that are actively doing this, if you give um, an incarcerated individual job skills, if you give an incarcerated individual the tools to access their trauma and heal from it, they come out and they don't go back to prison. Uh, the like the recidivism rate drops to almost zero. So it's just, there's clear efficacy that's being shown in these things. The challenge is convincing the public to support them because who cares about somebody that's been they committed a crime. Like that's maybe the last person on most people's minds. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, a lot of prison administration doesn't want to deal with it either because anything new uh, presents a potential threat to them. And, you know, when you're dealing with people that have committed violent crimes, for instance, it's very scary to experiment with anything as a, as a prison mm -hmm. facilitator. The program that I documented was actually a, someone who this person named Sarah Joy Marsh, uh, she was a student of Ram Dass's, who is also a, a licensed therapist. And I don't know if she has a neuroscience degree. She's certainly very educated on the topic, but she's developed a what she calls trauma-informed brain-sensitive yoga. And it is a uh, yoga therapy approach that she was uh, uh, has been experimenting with in prison for 30 years. And her newest program is teaching prisoners, lifers specifically, to become yoga teachers within the prisons. So in a few prisons in Oregon, she has created basically wellness communities where people that are there for life are now becoming like monks and are holding space for one another and helping facilitate healing within the prison community without the need of any outside interference. And it's having some pretty profound impacts and it's showing amazing efficacy in terms of changing the lives of these incarcerated individuals. And it's something that I would like to see, you know, crop up in more prisons across the country. And it's cheap. It's cheap. I mean, it doesn't cost much to bring just a yoga instructor into a prison. So it's cheaper than a clinical psychologist being there full time, probably yeah. a long shot and probably I mean, it, better results, but we need both probably. You absolutely need yeah. both. I mean, it, there needs to be all kinds of things. I mean, it's also a matter of, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned before job training, that's really essential too. Cause you know, if somebody, I, mean, I, I, a lot of the people I met in prison came in when they were like, 18, you know, you come into a prison when you're 18, you leave when you're 30, like, how are you going to get a job? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and brutal. if you don't, what happens to you? You know, you fall back on what you can. And uh, a lot of times that is things like, you know, drug dealing or crime or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you end up back in prison. And that's, it's, it's just not really a tenable model. I mean, we have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. And it's, it's, it's so obviously broken, mm -hmm. but unfortunately it's something that people don't really care enough to change when we have so many other issues pressing our society. It's really easy to forget about people who have been completely sequestered from that society. Yeah. We talk about it on the show. Like we need these people back in society, like yeah. for a lot of reasons. And that's, that's amazing. And you can see the psychedelic bridge there with Ram Dass. Oh, and yeah. uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so like what, um, what can you tell us about your like kind of orientation towards psychedelics these days? Ooh, I mean, We've had a lot of fun conversations. Yeah, about it's it. a very like uh, loaded question. I think there's a lot of <laughs> angles to approach on that. I mean, for me personally, psychedelics were a huge part in shaping who I am as a person. I started experimenting with them, I think when I was like either 13, 14 and maybe got a little too far in that direction at that time in my life. I, I, I sometimes say to people I was addicted to LSD, which I know it's not an addictive substance in terms of its physical nature, but in terms of the psychological nature, I was I, I, there was a lot of profound realizations and truths I was discovering about my life and others. And I kind of relied a little on the substance to sort of get me to that point. Uh, actually it was, we mentioned Ram Dass earlier. I read Be Here Now around that time. And that's when I really connected with the opening section of that book where he talks about his transition from Richard Alpert to Ram Dass and realizing like, you know, the LSD is not enough. The LSD is, it, it's not enlightenment in a pill. What it is, is sort of a tool for accessing your subconscious and for, you know, understanding perspectives outside of your own. And that uh, offers you the option to have greater empathy and have spiritual realizations, but ultimately you need to do the work. And so I did that. I, I had, I read that book. I had those experiences. And, you know, since then I've been trying to sort of live the teachings of the psychedelics at this point in my life. I don't do them too often. Every once in a while, I'll like have a trip just to like brush off the cobwebs, you know, get a little new perspective. But for the most part, I'm living a mostly sober life. 
That said, I'm a huge advocate. I, I think that psychedelics, again, I mentioned before, are just such an important tool in us understanding ourselves, understanding the world, understanding how our minds work. Like it, it's really something important and special. And um, uh, until we have a greater legalization, a greater application, less, more harm reduction, I think that I'm going to continue to be advocating for this for as long as I can. Hell yeah. So I kind of talk about art and like this, you might be the first artist that we've had on in a long time. I, my bad. <laughs> Cause like, I think this is such an important angle around culture change is like artists can really help lead a lot of culture change and artists do and have. Yeah. That's why we're, why we're there. Right. Yeah. Like, do you have any kind of like stock thoughts or any kind of thoughts about that bridge like it's it's awkward sometimes you say like, the bridge mean like between between creativity and psychedelics yeah so like i want to make an analogy and it's going to be a broken analogy on purpose but it's like baseball players using steroids or something or like athletes using performance enhancing drugs <laughs> but it's like you so know lsd is of, the performance enhancing drug of, of of art but we're seeing it in sports now too <laughs> yeah i mean well i mean lsd in general is a for for many people a performance mm. enhancing drug in many yeah. ways i mean silicon valley certainly seems to think so totally um yeah so i mean i i think that the biggest like boon in my art experience that LSD or psychedelics have provided me is it offered me a perspective on the artistic exp uh, on the artistic experience that has allowed me to create without inhibition. So, you know, I think that I think before I mentioned like LSD gives you perspectives or psychedelics give you perspectives outside yourself. The greatest barrier to being a creative is in my opinion ego. A lot of people have these narratives around their creativity where they think like, oh, I can't do something. I'm not good enough for something. For me personally, it was that um, my taste did not align with my capabilities at, at a young age, right? So like we're all working towards something, right? And we can see a greater vision for what we want to accomplish as a creative. And oftentimes our skills don't quite meet that. And that gap can seem insurmountable. And a lot of times when we think about ourselves as creatives, we notice that gap and use it as a as something to, I guess, like bludgeon ourselves with in terms of we're not good enough, we're not there, we'll never be good enough, whatever. And one of the great realizations that psychedelics offer me relating to my art is that um, I'm not creating anything. I personally am just in a, the accumulation of every experience that I've had in my life. Um, my tastes are the collection of every artist that ever inspired me. And in a sense, my creative capacity is, is being channeled by those influences mm -hmm. and them theirs. Uh, and so on and so forth, all the way back to the origins of art where, you know, what's happening is just this echoing throughout the ages of expression, each of these different perspectives trying to share what it means to communicate love throughout time. And maybe that's like a really heady, weird way of explaining it. Maybe I'm not doing the best job of it. I've definitely given this speech before, but uh, this is not my best telling of it. But the basic gist of it is I it, it helped me relinquish the idea that I am creating and that I am anything and instead just succumb to the process and engage with the medium in the way that one would a lover. And again, maybe that's like too heady or silly, but like just being present with the art is, is I think what allows it to reach its fullest blossom and just trusting the fact that I'm doing the best I can. I think to this point in time, I've never made a piece that I thought was the, the full throated expression I wanted it to be. And I look forward to a day where I can get there, but I'm just happy to be making, I'm happy to explore my life, my subconscious and, uh, to express that in the way I best know how. Some really interesting sections in um, Groff's The Way of the Psychonaut, Volume 2, about creativity. And um, he kind of does a whole series going. I think I skipped Da Vinci, but he's, you know, covering people like Goethe, Ramanujan, famous Indian mathematician, a bunch of other folks. And it's like the thing comes to them in a flash. Sometimes they're so brilliant that they can, like, backfill the why. <laughs> Right. Uh, in a day or two, like Isaac Newton was like, no, I know this. I've known this for years. Oh, you want me to prove it? Okay. Goes right. away for two days and has like mathematical proof. And it's like, huh, that's different. That's like a different person, but it's this holotropic states can like bring these things into manifestation in really interesting ways. Oh, absolutely. I think that, um, a lot of my art is very inspired by psychedelic experiences of mine. Uh, and there have been a few instances where I've had exactly that state experience where 
I had a an epiphany or an experience on psychedelics that I immediately knew what I wanted to express. And in like a day or two, I churned out a piece that ended up being one of my highest selling pieces, you know? So, so it's like a compulsion. You just like have to express it. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to the, like the best of my ability, it's a process of course. And unfortunately there's a lot of other factors that are asking for time in my life. So it doesn't always get to come out that way. But yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. And a lot of my art is inspired by the, it, 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 all of my art comes with a purpose. Like I have a couple of pop art pieces, sure. But like most of it is something that, I wanted to explore in my own self or, um, that I wanted to communicate because of a meaningful experience in terms of how, uh, in terms of how I appreciate love and understanding communication, whatever in this world that I needed to then, you know, put down. So like, for instance, you know, one series I did that was very inspired by psychedelics is, um, I had an acid trip, I think back in 2015, where I realized I was queer and I had to unpack what the hell that meant. And the process of doing that, I created my first AR piece, which was sort of like a dive into my own subconscious in terms of the ways on which I had internalized um, misogyny. And, you know, that experience was absolutely propelled by psychedelics. That's fascinating. It's a lot to unpack. I'm like trying to think through it. But <laughs> I'll save that for later. <laughs> sure, sure. But that's super interesting. Yeah. Like, you know, we see a lot of queer folks in psychedelics. I think the global number is like roughly 7% of population is queer in some way. And I think with psychedelics, we're going to understand that there's a lot more queer folks out there. But like, we don't know it because of our cultural programming and, you know, layers and layers and layers. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. I think we're in a really interesting time for queerness for sure. I think that, um, in a lot of ways, as we like unpack that social programming, like the definition of queer, I mean, queer, even as a word, it replies to something that is like other than, right? And I think that love on a spectrum and uh, sexuality on a spectrum is so much more chaotic than the, you know, firm binary that we've put it into for so long. And again, you know, if psychedelics are something that open up your perspectives, it allows you to sort of break models that you've been born into and raised with. And for a lot of people, that's discovering that their experience in whatever, wherever it falls on that spectrum is maybe outside of what we've been calling the norm for a long time, as opposed to necessarily what is the norm. And I, I suspect that the norm is that the experience of love and sexuality is so, 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 so much more diverse than we've been categorizing it as for a very long time. I've kind of been like explicitly steering away from going down the human sexuality rabbit hole because it is so complex. It's like about as equally complex as human nature itself. And, you know, psychedelics are complex enough. So I'm just focusing there. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, but I, I also think that these things are intertwined to a degree without like, you know, getting mm -hmm. too into it or anything like that. I think a lot of ways like, you know, kink, uh, it, it, it originates from knots in our psyche. I think a lot of times like kinks develop. Roth gets into this like crazy. Oh, Freud, yeah. It starts with Freud probably and then goes. Right. Like, so there's there's a yeah. huge relationship between the experience of, of psychological unwinding and sexuality. Yeah. And I think that these things are intrinsically aligned. And of course, psychedelics is a tool for, you know, opening up our minds uh, and unwinding in that way. I think that there's definitely a, a relationship between psychedelics and queerness that can be explored. But I also totally respect if that's not the conversation for today. <laughs> Yeah, just like kind of probably last point, like I've Groff on the brain. I'm working through Way of the Psychonaut right now. And like, you know, these two impulses that Freud had was like uh, Eros and Thanatos. So like love and death kind of, or like, you know, that that more um, libidinal drive and the, then the drive for death. And mm -hmm. I find that as an interesting thing. And you go back a little bit further to like Frederick Nietzsche and he's talking about the Apollonian and the Dionysian. It's like interesting you have no Interplay. idea what music that is to my ears. <laughs> I reference that because I, I I loved the birth of tragedy. So I I reference that all the time, and everyone looks at me like I'm speaking out my ass every time I talk about <sighs> Apollonian and Dionysus. People have to read some Nietzsche. I don't understand. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. And um, you know, it's not exactly philosophy, but it's fucking beautiful. Well, also, I mean, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because um, that was. Uh, Nietzsche's art criticism. Nietzsche 
a lot of his work at the time of his life was, uh, he was an art critic. And the the birth of tragedy, where he first discusses Apollonian and Dionysian, is in relationship to what is high art. Uh, and high art is something that is a mix of the two. It is something that is that stimulates both the intellectual nature of the artistic experience, like talks about concepts, ideas, things that are Apollonian, and something that also stimulates the heart and the emotional experience of life, which is Dionysian. And so, in his view, high art is... Animal or ecstatic, maybe. Exactly, yeah. So, his in his view, high art is the marriage of those two things. And, you know, again, I, I've never made a piece that fair. I feel is my full throat expression. And it's because I don't feel that anything I've ever made fully balances out those energies in the way I would like them to. But again, working on it. Yeah. So like Groff does a really interesting job, like synthesizing this as like, here's the underlying kind of tensions. And then everything kind of like comes out of these underlying tensions. And, you know, he's pointing backwards because there's a lot more at play for Groff. It's a lot more like animist and... um reality being a lot more complex and dynamic than maybe like a dead universe. Yeah. Well, if we're going to talk about like the, the things that are, are the basis of why we create art, mm -hmm. so I think it's actually a really interesting thing totally. in general and that psychedelics do play into in the, yeah. because I think that why we create art is it, it's, we're trying to sort of express our unique little, experience of God in this life. And not to, and I'm not trying to be like religious or anything like that. I, I, I just don't really have the better terminology for it, but like our, our, our place in this universe. And we live in a world that is uh, turbulent, that has a lot of chaos and mm. hurt and tragedy and all these things. And from our unique vantage point as a blip of perspective in this world, we see that and want to communicate either I am this uh, and, you know, I, I want to be sort of accepted or I, I see this thing that I want to fix. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the drive for art comes from a need to sort of communicate love and connection. And in a lot of ways, that connection is the experience of God. And I think that, you know, in a sense, art comes from almost like a divine place in that regard. And psychedelics are also a tool for us experiencing that. I mean, I, again, I'm not a religious person by any means, but, you know, psychedelic experiences are often spiritual experiences and i think it's because they touch on the same thing what it means to live in oneness with the world mm. Mm. yeah reframing your place in the cosmos is really uh, an important task and people should engage in that and, and the drive it? for unity within that mm. i mean if, if you're talking about opposing forces right there's entropy you know our world like moving towards its eventual heat death and separation. But then I think that the nature of life itself is something that works in opposition to that. It's a need for further complexity. It is the novelization of, of our reality as we find new and more complex means of expressing and evolving. Have you heard the term negentropy? No, what's that? <laughs> exactly this. It's like the human creativity and the spirit being the thing that could perhaps prevent heat death or like prolong the heat death or oh. something in some way. I mean, I, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that that's giving us a pretty, uh, a huge place in the cosmic <laughs> scheme of things. I, I don't personally believe that. I think mm -hmm. that I, I, I suspect that the human experience is just going to be a blip in the time of, of mm -hmm. the universe. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to get to live to see the end of it, but, I'm uh, not. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I certainly am not, <laughs> but you know, I do think that life and the ways in which it gets more and more complex and develops is a cosmic force that operates in opposition to entropy. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. maybe that's like, I don't know. Again, I, I feel like I keep heading into like really heady directions. You know, I, <laughs> I'm not a physicist. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But <laughs> <sighs> A big portion of my like philosophy undergrad was like cosmology. And we talked a lot about like these kind of deeper early physics, like right around the start of the big bang and all this junk. And, that's where a lot of my stuff comes from. And like, you know, my teacher was tying a lot of Plato and the forms into all that, plus some like modern physics. It's like outrageous, but that was my indoctrination. I'm trying to figure it out from there. I mean, it's definitely a, uh, a fascinating field mm. of thought, but you know, but what do I, we do with it? Right. Exactly. <laughs> like I, at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, I, all I know is I know very little. And one of I, my favorite lines is if so, so what? If so, so what? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, these things are definitely fun to philosophize about. Mm -hmm. Definitely some acid thinking for sure. But <laughs> I think that at the end of the day, it's it's about practical application. And I will say maybe one component of the practical application is sort of, I guess, like a spiritual grounding of uh, an understanding of our place in the universe or the insignificance of a human life and sort of 
opening our mind up to a more objective, more cosmic perspective. The universe absolutely does have its benefits in terms of how we perceive ourselves and how we relate to others. It's pretty easy to, you know, have greater empathy for others when you can think outside of just your mind or your tribe. So maybe there there, there is practical application to it, but certainly not in the uh, really like um, divorced from the human experience way that we've been discussing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what have you been seeing in, in Los Angeles and in, in kind of like the art and psychedelic scenes? Is there like a certain kind of evolution you've noticed around here? Oof. Oh, again, that's a very loaded question for me. Um, <laughs> I love those. It makes my right, job easier. So, okay, I have two answers to yeah. that. Um, the first is we, it, it, I mean, I'm seeing so much more psychedelic acceptance uh, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, even in like non-progressive scenes. Like I, I'm able to now openly converse with people who have never done psychedelics in a professional capacity in a way that is non-judgmental. And that's really beautiful and amazing. I think that at least here and like our hippie West coast, Californication, whatever, like, you know, uh, perspective or like, I've uh, even noticed Republican voters in Los Angeles, wealthy ones, very, very interested. Yeah. I mean, I, my, I grew up in a very conservative family. Uh, they were all Trump voters mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can have open conversations with them about psychedelics where they're not looking at me left eyed. So like, it's, 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 it's definitely a evolved in a lot of ways and certainly within the art community i think that there's just so much acceptance and appreciation of psychedelics mm -hmm. and i mean the arts community especially here in la is very open it's very supportive of anybody's expression and creative it's mm. it, it's um it's not very competitive it's very um mm -hmm. it's very beautiful and supportive as far as psychedelic art I, we're in it's best of times, worst of times. I think that there's a lot of, and, and maybe this is getting me hot water with some people saying this, but <laughs> I think that there's a, a lot of lack of originality in the psychedelic art scene. Totally. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. people, I mean, you know, I, you know, all love so to do we just walk around saying derivative. At a, I, I, that's yeah. I mean, that's basically <laughs> the word. I mean, like, cause like, I mean, listen, like Alex and Alison Gray and Amanda Sage and Andre Jones and some of the other really big heads of visionary art scene that like, you know, uh, kind of built their audience out of Burning Man. They are amazing and they've taught a lot of people and inspired a lot of people. Uh, I certainly know I've been inspired by them, but I think that a lot of the artwork that I've seen in the visionary art scene following that is very derivative. I mean, how many times can we, Ex, like explore the psychedelic space using the same mish technique to like, you know, just have like, you know, a flower blossoming into this or that or sacred geometry or what have you. I think that there's a degree to which a lot of what is being explored has been explored and is not really being expressed in a way that adds anything to the conversation. Mm. And uh, again, like I said, that's a controversial thing to say within the art world. And again, I'm very supportive of anyone expressing themselves or putting them, their work out there in any way, in any capacity. And I don't think that what is being made is shitty art necessarily. Just that, you know, what I would really like to be seeing more of within psychedelic art and psychedelic art communities is more unique ways of, of distilling the information that the downloads that come from psychedelic experiences uh, rather than using all of the same old tropes and images that we've had before, because there is a greater depth to be plumbed with these things. And I think a lot of people are not doing the work to explore those depths. Mm. That's the mission for you all out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's something that I, I advocate for. I mean, I also mm -hmm. do a lot of curation in LA mm -hmm. And right now, one of my big focuses in art curation is, uh, like, as I said, I do augmented reality stuff. I'm really passionate about advocating for artists to explore new ways of pushing their mediums. So beyond just augmented reality, you know, uh, how can we utilize technology uh, to explore new dimensions in our art, whether that is having our art have a time relationship or an experiential component to it that can be facilitated by technology. I mean, whether or not it's in terms of the depth of the art, uh, in terms of what it's trying to communicate, or in terms of how the medium is experienced, I really want to push for people and for artists to explore, you know, newness and how they can communicate. Especially because right now we live in an age where flat art is freely accessible on our phone at any given moment. You know, we can scroll through Instagram and see amazing art any moment. So in a lot of ways, I feel like for free too. So in a lot of ways, I think that that's um, devalued a lot of art. And I think that in, a, in some ways that's problematic, but in other ways it's really great. And I think that what we as artists need to do now to both differentiate ourselves from that free art experience and also to, you know, push 
what art can be in a world where it's so readily, where millions of artists are readily accessible at any moment is to differentiate ourselves uh, by exploring these new directions. Right. Like the riches are inside you <laughs> and uh, you can make them available and share, spread it. It's so unfortunately, I think we're on <laughs> got a wrap Great. sucks, but we're going to do more. Yeah. Uh, this is super awesome. And um, I think we covered a lot of really interesting ground, but where can people find you? On yeah. the blackjack tables? Blackjack. <laughs> yeah, he's joking because I, <laughs> I we, we just hung out at LIB where I was contributing to a friend's installation that's a blackjack table where you can bet anything but money uh, <laughs> called Frick Frack Blackjack. But no, I, so where, funny. Yeah, where I can be found um, is uh, on Instagram at Psychotronic Solutions. Uh, psycho like your brain, tronic like an electronic, solutions like solutions. You know, I do have Facebook and Twitter. Don't use them as much for my art promotion. Instagram is definitely my main thing. And I do have a website. It has two URLs, either psychotronicsolutions.com, super easy, or let's do the mind warp.com, oh. um, which is a little bit more fun one. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of my work's on there. People can go see that. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to experience the full AR experience. So I have like the video version of my mm-hmm. art and the images of the physical, but it's best experienced in person when you can hold your phone up and see the whole thing like, uh, like unfold. <laughs> and um, you're going to see a lot of Sawyer's work once the TV show comes out and can't wait. It's going to be so fun. Awesome. Yeah. So, Sawyer, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And there you have it. Sawyer Hurwitz, director, Psychedelics Tonight. So it was a really fun project to work on that with Sawyer. I hope we get the opportunity to do more with Sawyer in the future. Time will tell. And um, I know I had a great time, I hope. I hope Sawyer enjoyed himself as well. And yeah, Sawyer, thank you so much for that podcast. It was really kind of you to come all the way uh, to downtown LA just to record with me. And yeah, I'm just really thankful <laughs> for the whole team at Altered for helping us put this thing together. So again, altered.tv. September 26th, it airs. So that was yesterday for you listeners listening as this releases. And uh, again, altered.tv, you can check it out on Roku, Plex, Apple, App Store, your browser, Android TV, Samsung TV. Yeah, maybe a couple other places. <laughs> but yeah, check it out. It'll, it'll work wherever you are. All right. Thank you all for tuning in to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore signing off. We'll see you next time, everybody. Bye-bye.